All right. Well, that was uh, almost miraculous. <laughs> That, that I'm here on time. <laughs> yeah. And um, we got a lot to cover, so better get started. Once again, uh, welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church Sunday School class going through the book of Judges. Today we will be covering chapters uh, chapter 10, verse 17, through chapter 12, verse 15. And uh, I'm especially excited about this because in addition to growing in our knowledge and understanding of God's Word, we get to talk about two things I enjoy, which are maps and military strategy. So why don't we begin with prayer? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, Father, we thank You for Your Word Father, we thank you that, uh, that it gives us life, that it's useful for correcting, rebuking, and instructing us. Father, we ask that you would give us wisdom to see these things as we study your word today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as an update from last week and really the entire book of Judges, as a review, and you may recall Pastor Gilbert kind of emphasizing this last week, um, Israel continues to suffer, and uh, they've cried out for God to intervene, and this is a, a repeated pattern in the book of Judges where God blesses his people. Uh, then they rebel, followed by God handing them over, and then they cry out, and God delivers them with the, uh, in this case, the use of a judge. And then you may also recall uh, in one of the last passages that we read last week that the Ammonites were beginning to marshal their military forces and arming themselves against the Israelites in Gilead near Mizpah. So why don't we pick up, uh, I'll read beginning in uh, chapter 10, verse 17. And I'm just going to read to, uh, to verse 28 of chapter 11 at this point. All right, hear God's word. Then the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead, and the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said one to another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you were in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us, 
if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all, all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me, that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel on coming up from Egypt took away my land, from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore it peaceably. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to them, and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Sodom, or king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived in the east side of the land of Moab and and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. And they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Now are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and in its villages, and in Eror and its villages, and all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. And this ends the reading of God's word at this point. So to begin with, let's ask some questions. Who is Jephthah? What what is it that we know about him? Well, according to many scholars, he actually ruled concurrently with Samson, uh, but we do know that he's a mighty warrior, and uh, one example of a definition of a mighty warrior is a man who is displaying courage in the midst of adversity and held in high esteem by the community. Uh, however, that kind of conflicts a little bit with the the fact that he is the son of uh, Gilead, the Gileadite, but he also is the son of a prostitute. Can can you say dysfunction? So he obviously has a a very dysfunctional background. Um, 
and you can kind of see that in the text where it says that Gilead had a, had a son with a prostitute and his wife also bore sons, almost as if this is going on at the same time. Uh, so it's not surprising as, as time goes on, it seems that uh, years have gone by that the sons grew up, the text says, and Jephthah is driven out. And it's obvious, I think, for anybody reading Scripture, you, you kind of know what's going to come next, where they feel that their inheritance is threatened uh, by the fact that this, this uh, illegitimate son is here in our midst. And so it says that they... That, that Jephthah fled. Uh, in other words, he was chased out of, uh, of his home. And uh, certainly not the last savior. to be rejected. So uh, just as a, for our first map here, as a quick review, you see, as we read in our text, Kadesh, if you can barely make it out, it's the, the, the smallest town to the lower left of the map here in the south. And then you see Edom is the first town to the west, or excuse me, to the east. Uh, down to the south, and then Moab. And the area that we are talking about is just above the Dead Sea, uh, kind of near Gad, and just to the, uh, to the west of Ammon there. But these are the... So this is a, a good map that shows where the initial tribes settled, and then also these enemies that we read about constantly, whether it be the Philistines, they're over on the coast uh, to, the, to the west, or the uh, Amalekites in the southwest, uh, and so on. So where does the, uh, back, back to Jephthah, where does the son of a prostitute go when he is chased out of his home? Well, he goes where people will take him. And uh, as we're told, into the arms of worthless men. And just to give you some idea, if you can think back to the map we just saw, so there's the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the, those all may be familiar places to you from other passages in Scripture. There's the Jordan River. And uh, we read about Mizpah, and there's Gilead, and so he's chased out of Gilead to the kind of outer regions, uh, probably, you know, along the border of where Israel's tribe, the, the Gileadites were, or the, uh, whoever it was back there, probably Manasseh, were established. So in Tob among troublemakers and scoundrels. And then we see that uh, the, Am or excuse me, the, uh, the Israelites come, uh, the Gileadites come seeking Jephthah as they're trying to figure out who might help them. Uh, as the Ammonites we read about in verse 4 are making war against Israel. And it, it seems pretty obvious in verse 5 here, as the, as the elders of Gilead go to the land of Tob, you know, they're kind of thinking, well, an enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they go after Jephthah, and they say, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. Imagine what Jephthah might be thinking here. I was such a stench of a human being to you that you drove me from your midst, and now you come begging for my help? And uh, notice Jephthah's incredulous response in verse 7, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now? 
when you were in distress. So he is suggesting he was in distress at one point, and they didn't seem to care too much, but now they care. And uh, I don't know if, if you notice it, but you can hear the echo of what occurred in the previous study last week. This is very familiar or very similar to the same words that, that God uses when the Israelites come to him and ask for help, where in chapter 10, verse 11 through 14, God says, beginning, uh, says, did I not save you? Um, and notice, the, uh, notice Israel's nonsensical response. So Jephthah points out their obvious hypocrisy, but then they, they sidestep that and they say, well, that's why we're here now. Well, that's not answering the question. Like, why did you reject me? Oh, we, just, we need your help. So as a result, Jephthah in verse 9 leverages the situation just like someone who's lived in Tob for many years would. And he says, uh, you make me the top dog, the big chief, and I'll deliver you. And so they agree to those terms. So what's the application here? I don't know uh, how many of you might be in a motorcycle gang, uh, like uh, Jephthah, you know, kind of the ancient, the, the equivalent of an ancient motorcycle gang, uh, but, uh, but he certainly was rejected, and, and that is something that is not uncommon for, for people. Um, I don't know if you, you all are aware of Winston Churchill's history, um, obviously a hero from World War II, um, you know, one of the key figures in helping turn the tide against the Nazis. But uh, he was neglected in his childhood. He, um, he was thought to be not very bright by his father, and so he decided for someone of his standing uh, as a, no a noble man, that uh, he, he had to turn to the military for service because that was about all that he could do. Uh, he applied three times to the Royal Military Academy. Which means that he, uh, he failed twice. And uh, eventually, graduated high in his class, but uh, in addition to that, I don't know if you know, he had a speech impediment, uh, if you can believe it. Uh, there are comments about the fact that if he had prepared remarks, he did very well, but he, he could not speak in an impromptu fashion. Um, and most of you probably know the fact that he was viewed as a kook. Uh, at the beginning of World War II, you know, with Chamberlain, who now is uh, one of the great clowns of history, um, which I see some parallels in what we're doing today. Um, but but he was the distinguished, dignified uh, politician. But obviously. Uh, things don't always, um, they are not always what they appear to be. Um, so if you have been rejected, you might be able to relate to Jephthah's situation. And uh, I'll just say that we don't always know uh, what people have gone through, what their history is. But I think the real application here is that ultimately it's the Lord who is rejected here. And this is, this is a trend not only in the book of Judges but throughout Scripture where Israel's sin leads them 
to these places of desperation. And after rejecting their God, they cry out to him. And I guess this would be one of those, but God, who's rich in his mercy, hears their cries. Um, if you can believe it. So I think the application for us in this regard is to reflect on the character of a rejected God who yet pursues foolish, foolish and rebellious sinners. Well, continuing on here with Jep- Jephthah and his diplomacy on behalf of, of God's people, we see this long-distance debate taking place between Jephthah and the king of the Ammonites. And in so many words, Jephthah says, what's your problem? And the, and the king of the Ammonites says, you took my land and you're going to give it back. Uh, so what's all this about? Uh, once again, going back here, uh, Jephthah in so many words says, your version of the story is not true. And he proceeds to tell the history of Israel's entrance into the land. And I think uh, I, I recall last week, Pastor Gilbert emphasizing the value of remembering. And, and we ought to be people who remember, not just our own history, but also the history of the church. And you know, we have circumstances here that where we, we pray and the Lord answers our prayers. Um, but Jephthah goes into great detail, and, and it, it seems pretty clear that he knew, he knew the Bible. So somehow he picked up Bible during his lifetime, uh, despite being a motorcycle gang leader. So he was a Bible-reading motorcycle gang leader. Uh, also recount that he, he provides great accuracy in describing the last 300 years. And uh, just as a side note, many many scholars use this passage to date events in in Scripture. Um, And he describes Israel beginning at Kadesh. I pointed that out. That is the place where Moses sent the 12 spies, the 10 cowardly spies and two brave Spies, and then uh, and then we see Moses requested safe passage from the king of Edom, but he was denied. Anybody know who who Edom is? The descendants of Esau. That's right. And then after uh, after that rejection, Moses and Israel go around Edom and around Moab in compliance with these diplomatic requests that they've made to these leaders. And they end up getting to the boundary of the king of the Amorites, Sihon. But the difference between what happened with Moses making these requests with Edom and Moab Moab, is that it remained diplomatic. But in the case of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, it says in verse 20 that Sihon, quote, gathered all his people together and went out against Israel. So they immediately confronted in a warlike manner. So in other words, Sihon picked a fight with Israel, and Israel won. And therefore, based on the rules of war, they earn the spoils. And that included the Arnon to Jabok, which is, if you can see here in this map, Arnon about midway through the Dead Sea up to Jabok, which is you know, roughly halfway up the Jordan River. Um, and, and you see as Jephthah goes through this passage, you see the, uh, the mockery starting to build up. 
Um, one of my former pastors used to say that of the various forms of humor, that sarcasm is the one that's biblical. That's the one we find in Scripture. That's not always appreciated, but, uh, but we see that. You know, we, we have examples of Elijah mocking the, uh, the, the priests of, of Baal, and here we, we see uh, Jephthah saying in so many words, why don't, you, why don't you just take whatever your God gives you? Oh, that's right. He gave you nothing. We have it. So our God gave us this territory, and he mocks Chemosh. And in so many words, it, it reminds me a little bit of William Wallace, Braveheart, where he, he says, I'm going to pick a fight. Yeah, that's kind of what we get, it seems, in this passage where Jephthah is saying to the king of the Amorites or Ammonites, your buddy Sihon picked a fight with us and our God, and he lost. Maybe if your god Chemosh didn't stink so bad, then maybe Sihon would have won, but he didn't. Sounds like you got a personal problem, because by the way, your boy Balak couldn't do any better. And in fact, he didn't even sniff victory. And also, by the way, that was 300 years ago. So let's do this thing. As a side note, uh, any idea who the Moabites and Ammonites are? That's right. Yeah, the descendants of, uh, as Joe says, the descendants of, of Lot's two daughters um, with that incestuous affair. And uh, right here is the picture that I couldn't find of my trip to Jordan. And as I was, I, I think I actually was reading through this section of scripture and I'm in Amman, Jordan, and it dawns on me, Amman, Jordan. You mean like the Ammonites. And uh, there actually was a departure uh, which is how we take off out of a base to go somewhere. There was a departure out of Amman named the Moab II departure uh, based on this section to the east of, of the Dead Sea, which I don't know if you've been to the Dead Sea, but whatever you do, do not rub your eyes uh, if you swim in the Dead Sea. It's very bad. Um, yeah, I had the privilege of worshiping in an Orthodox well, I, it was a evangelical kind of California-style church, but it was on Orthodox Easter, um, which is today uh, as well, but uh, that was back in 2008 or 2009. So nevertheless, continuing on, uh, Jephthah basically puts his foot, foot down and he, he draws a line as they've continued these diplomatic relations, and that uh, leads me to the, the next topic that is kind of interesting. You think? <laughs> so, anybody know who this is? I wouldn't imagine. Was he? <laughs> It's Karl von Clausewitz, who is a contemporary of Napoleon, uh, but he's mostly known um, by my wife as a uh, because she's read a lot of the, my my graduate school papers that included discussions about Clausewitz. Uh, he's famous for a book that he wrote called On War, and. Uh, he argued that there were three objectives for achieving military success. One was defeating your, the, the enemy military, which makes enough sense, occupying his country, and then finally changing his will. 
And uh, I think this is the most important idea and often what he's most remembered for. In other words, like Nick Saban says, make them quit. Change what they want. Uh, and one of the things he's known for is the idea that warfare is an ex his ob observation that warfare is an extension of politics. And that's what we have here with Jephthah. Uh, so they have been seeking to achieve diplomatic ends. Jephthah is not starting a war. He's trying to reason with him. He's using diplomacy. But it, as he goes back and forth with the king of the Ammonites, he sees that there is no there is no diplomatic resolution to this problem. And so, time to go to war. And we see this in other places. So I, I, it, I don't know exactly that this is the case, but this is the same idea that, for instance, Thomas Jefferson used in the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Um, where he, he says, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. So in other words, we've tried to reason with you and we are not getting anywhere, so we're gonna let the supreme judge of heaven decide this matter. Uh, that will be the deliberation at this point. And so, you know, I think that is a somewhat biblical observation here that uh, Clausewitz and I think Jefferson borrows. So we see the uh, we see the nameless king of the Ammonites basically saying, "Well, I'm not I'm not listening to you, Jephthah." And so we'll continue on here. Let me pick up our reading in verse 29 through chapter 12, verse 7, for this next section that we'll discuss. Here's God's word. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over the Ammonites, over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them from Aror to the neighborhood of Mineth. 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karamim, Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you've become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites, so she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughter of Israel, the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament 
the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite, four days in the year. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of Jordan. Of the Jordan at that time, forty-two thousand of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. All right, so we have. Jephthah's victory, and then this really, really stupid vow that he makes. Now, notice at the beginning it says in verse 29, the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. This is a phrase that's used six times in the book of Judges. It's first used with Othniel, which is just one little passage, one little paragraph, and it's a very short, descript passage. that describes the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him. In in this case, Judges 3, verse 10 says, The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Reshathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. Now, each succeeding time, it seems that uh, there's there's a correspondence with the Spirit of the Lord and the, the troubles and the desperate situation that the Israelites are in. And we see that by the time we are reading about Samson, it's saying that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Um, thank, thank God for His generous outpouring of the Holy Spirit this side of, of, of Pentecost and the Lord Jesus Christ coming. But we see that each time that we read this phrase, it leads to God's enemies being defeated. And, uh, and we see after we read that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, that uh, it says he passed through. And it's reminiscent of, uh, of Israel passing through the Red Sea. The Lord has done it, and he, he did it with ease. And then it says that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah, which is one of those places where the Ammonites initially settled back in chapter 10, verse 17. And then we have maybe one of the most bizarre passages in Scripture where Jephthah is motivated to make a vow before the Lord. As uh, commentator Delrath Davis described it, uh, tragic zeal seemed to have uh, motivated Jephthah. So some of y'all might recall this story, 1954 Cotton Bowl, where... A rice running back was 
He had just evaded a tackle from Bart Starr because they played both ways back then and was on his way to a 90-yard touchdown. And then a guy from Alabama's sideline came off the bench and tackled him. And uh, a couple of days later, both of the players appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. And there's a video that, you know, I don't know if y'all should all watch it, but uh, a video where Tommy Lewis, who's the Alabama player, when he was asked, why'd you do it? He said, well, I guess I was just too full of Alabama. Uh, <laughs> well, in this fallen world, sometimes people do impromptu and make regrettable decisions. Um, I don't think that this is a foxhole type of faith that Jephthah is expressing here. I think he was just dumb. This was just very foolish. Um, but nevertheless, we see, uh, going back to chapter 11, verse 32 to 34, that, that God gives Jephthah military victory over the Ammonites. The writer of the Judges provides very few details as he describes his uh, victory. The judge of heaven resolved the matter, and Israel was awarded a victory. And then we see this tragic homecoming. The writer describes it in uh, kind of agonizing detail, kind of like he's rubbing it in, like it was his child, his only child, and he didn't have any other sons or daughters really kind of rubbing it in, pouring salt on the wound. And I think certainly there's something to take away here with regard to our understanding of what a vow is and how seriously uh, it ought to be taking, taken. A, a solemn promise, a pledge. And can you imagine that a, a God who is called a covenant God which is maybe just a more serious vow where it says, this is what's going to happen to me if I break my vow, if I break, break this covenant. Do you think he wouldn't take it seriously? So nevertheless, we ought to think about that when we consider vows um regarding this passage it may it may impact our victorian sensibilities to think that like it's a little bit ambiguous the the language here did did Jephthah really did he really burn his daughter and uh here's what Delrath Davis says it sounds as though i think Jephthah actually offered up his daughter as a sacrifice that is correct that is, I believe, the most natural reading of verses 30, 31, and 39. I do not say that the writer, let alone Yahweh, approves of it. He never says he does. He simply reports the matter. I do not say we understand all that is involved, for, the, for biblical writers frequently refuse to elaborate on what we are curious about. And in any case, we cannot get inside Jephthah's head. Uh, that's... I think pretty helpful. So that ends one very bizarre episode from Scripture only to be followed by another very bizarre episode in Scripture where we have this situation between the Ephraimites and, uh, and Jephthah. And you see Ephraim over here in the, in the west along the coast uh, where the Ephraimites are basically saying, how dare you, how dare you, Jeph Jephthah, go out and fight without our without our help. And once again, Del Ralph Davis des describes it as, uh, they thought they were somebodies, and they couldn't imagine being somebodies that a nobody would go out without seeking their approval. But Jephthah, being a former nobody, didn't really have a lot of care about what some somebodies thought. And uh, you can see the conflict coming. It's like a train coming down the track. The former leader of an ancient roving motorcycle gang 
with, who strong-armed the elders of Gilead, then defeated the, uh, the Ammonites in battle. He's now being physically threatened by the uppity country club crowd. We see how this is going to go. Uh, so the men of Gilead and the men of Ephraim fight, and Gilead gains the ground. And then we see this example of uh, Shibboleth, Old Testament jeopardy. Uh, so it reminds me of a buddy of mine whose name is Brian Myers, and he was uh, over in Birmingham, and they were sounding out syllables of their names. The teacher said, you know, when you say your, your name, you, you clap. And uh, he, he said, Brian. I'll try not to make it too loud. Brian. And she corrected him. She says, no, it's Brian. <laughs> and it's like southern accents, like I versus I, or can't versus can't. Or like one of our elders here says, code versus cold. Uh, Boston accents are similar. Ka versus car. Fa versus far. Uh, the men of Gilead are intent on eradicating the Ephraimites from their territory, and they, they play this game, and it says they slaughtered 42,000, and it just shows the further just dysfunction that is beginning to develop among the, uh, among the people of Israel. And then let me briefly read this last passage. I realize we're running out of time here. It says... Picking up in verse 8, after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside his clan, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ajalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, died and was buried at Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. That ends the reading of God's word. So, Lots of, uh, lots of sons, lots of daughters. It seems like it must be a mostly peaceful time. Uh, so in conclusion here, two main points. We see God being forsaken by his people and yet him continuing to offer deliverance. And we see uh, a very flawed judge and there's this kind of sense that there is a better way. So with, with this flawed judge comes a flawed salvation. So there's this, this grief associated with the victory, especially with regard to, uh, to Jephthah's daughter. Now, obviously we don't have a lot of time, but I would encourage you to... Uh, Anybody know where, where else Jephthah is mentioned in the Bible without, except for Job? Hebrews 11. Yeah, so Jephthah, this roving motorcycle gang leader, is mentioned right next to David in what's called the, the Hall of Faith. Um, and then last point is that this leaves us longing for a, for a perfect and righteous judge that we get uh, in, in Christ who has placed all of his enemies under his footstool and one day our faith will be made sight with regard to that. So why don't we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, thank you that we can study your word together and uh, we ask that you would 
be with us now as we prepare for worship, that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds as we uh, hear your word preached this morning. In Jesus' name.